following sermon is read from volume 5 of the six-volume set entitled Puritan Sermons 1659 to 1689, being the morning exercises at Cripplegate. This complete six-volume set of Puritan sermons is available from Stillwater's Revival Books on Calvinism Bookshelf CD Volume 1 in SWRB's 3 for 1 CD Super Sale at swrb.com. This set is also available from SWRB in printed format at swrb.com. Stillwater's Revival Books makes thousands of classic Puritan books and sermons available free and at great discounts in print, audio and video formats at swrb.com. If you would like to join our email list to stay up to date about all the new, free and discounted Puritan and reform resources we make available, please send an email to swrb at swrb.com with the word add in the subject line. For more information about the Puritan Publishing Ministry of SWRB, please email us at swrb at swrb.com. Welcome to Sermon 9 by the Reverend Stephen Watkins, entitled The Misery of Man's Nature, A State by Nature. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Ephesians 2.3 You have heard the doctrine of man's fall and of original sin opened and applied. This text generally leads to speak of man's misery through sin. As to the coherence, briefly, the Apostle's scope is to display the glory of the Lord's grace by comparing the sinful and cursed estate of the Ephesians and others by nature with the dignity and privileges conferred on them in Christ. He insists extremely, mainly, on three heads. 1. He describes the natural estate and course of the Ephesians and all other Gentiles in them, their estate. You were dead in trespasses and sins, verse 1. Their course. You walked holy in sin, pricked forward by corrupt customs, which in several ages had taken place, and were effectual to hold and hearten you in the same tracks, and the devil, that eminently bore away in others, ruled and acted you likewise at his very will. This was yours, and the Gentiles' estate and course. Verse 2. 2. He applies the whole equally and indifferently to himself and to the whole body of the Jewish nation, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, verse 3. As if he had said, such children of disobedience were we also, as deep in sin and open to wrath as you Gentiles were. He would by no means have anything that, speaking so of the Gentiles, he exempted the Jews from the same ground of shame and despair in themselves, though he knew full well that this point went exceedingly cross to the grain of that people, who greatly boasted themselves to be the holy seed and children of Abraham, and despised the Gentiles as idolatrous, unclean, bastard brood. Ezra 9.2, John 8.33, Galatians 2.15, Romans 10.3, 11.24, and especially the Pharisees, of which Levin himself once was, Acts 26.5, and Philippians 3.5, who not only disdained the Gentiles, but thought and spoke contemptibly of God's heritage, namely the common people of their own nation, as a base and cursed crew. John 7.49, and 9.34. He pricks this bladder, affirming proudly, roundly of himself and all the Jews without exception, that as to their course, whilst unregenerate, they did whatsoever their sensual and carnal man willed, liked and inclined to, and as to a state, were children of wrath, as much as others, even as the very despised Gentiles themselves were. The great temporary difference flowing from grace. Psalm 147, 19 and 20. 
ended not their being the same, the very same with the Gentiles by nature. This and no other was the estate and course of the Jews likewise. Three, he set over against all this, in them both, the quickening and recovering grace of Christ in the Gentile, verse 1, and in the Jew, verse 4. The words read contain a brief, comprehensive description of the misery that Jews, and consequently Gentiles with them, are under by nature. And in the words, observe these two particulars. 1. The case of all men, Jews and Gentiles, alike described, children of wrath. Do not understand this actively as children of disobedience, verse 2, are disobedient children, so that the children of wrath should be angry and wrathful people, but passively that are obnoxious unto wrath indefinitely, which though it principally relates to that chiefest pressing insupportable burden, namely the Lord's wrath, yet includes consequently the wrath and power of Satan, the terrors and rage of conscience, the vengeance and assaults of every creature, etc. The Hebrewism, children of wrath, implies, one, desert. It shall be, if the wicked man be, a child of beating, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face, according to his fault, by a certain number. Deuteronomy 25.2 Which the Septuagint solidly renders worthy of stripes. And so the Targums, in like manner, concurrently with our Bibles, a son guilty and worthy to be beaten. So Matthew 23.15 Ye make him twofold more the child of hell, that is, more worthy of hellfire than yourselves. Two, tendency, bent, and an addictness to involve themselves under wrath. But the son of perdition, John 17:12, who poured out himself in ways of self-destruction, he had many and excellent means to the contrary, but nothing would hold him back. Self-damnation is not proper to Judas, but a very common sin, and men ordinarily treasure up to themselves wrath. Romans 2.5 Love, death. Proverbs 8.36 3. The event and issue which shall befall them if they do abide such, namely that they shall be destroyed and the eternal wrath of God abide upon them. So Judas gave up himself to those sins that not only deserved and tended to destruction but would certainly destroy him. So 1 Samuel 10, uh, 20, verse 31, He is a son of death, namely, deserves to die, and shall surely die. Now gather all these things together. Our estate and course is such by nature, as deserves destruction, tends and leads to destruction, and will end. And the Lord hath peremptorily fixed and ordained, without a change, shall end, in eternal destruction. 2. The rise of this case expressed by nature, which implies, 1. The term from which this commences, namely the very first receiving of our natures and beings from our parents. From the first original and moment of our being, we receive with all a liableness to the wrath and curse of God. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51, 5. 2. The ground for which this wrath impends and hovers, namely nature, not first created, but that was upright, after, well that was upright after God, but the corrupted nature, which is conveyed and derived with our beings, Genesis 1, 27, and Ecclesiastes 7, 29. This very nature leads to, deserves, and will lodge under eternal wrath. Every mother's child in whom regeneration and transportation into Christ are not found. The doctrine then, comprising the sum of the text, is this. Doctrine. Every man and woman, from their very first conception, through a corrupted nature, are under the Lord's wrath 
and continuing such, not newborn and engrafted into Christ, that wrath shall abide upon them forever. We may not mince and extenuate here with the Palladian, as if this only were by imitation. Flatterers of nature may lessen the wound, but heirs of grace should and will rather magnify their position. Nor may we limit and confine this truth as if it concerned native Turks, hankered papists, and the proselytes of the Pharisees only to be children of hell. Matthew 23:15. When it knocks at every of our doors, Jew and Gentile, promiscuously, neither people nor ministers, nor apostles, can exempt themselves, great and small, rich and poor, those which the Lord hath not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain our salvation by their Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Yet, by nature, are children of wrath, even as others. This wrath in the scriptures has several names. Respectively to the lawgiver, it is called wrath respectively to the law itself, the curse. Respectively to the effects of both, it is translated vengeance, Romans 3, 5. Man by nature is exposed unto all these. 1. He is exposed to the wrath of the lawgiver. Here, 1. Take some cautions that we may duly conceive of wrath, the root of all penal afflictions on God's part as sin is the meritorious root on man's part. All wars with men begin in wrath. Animosities first boil within, and then wars break out. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Can come they not hence, even from your lusts, which war in your members? James 4, verse 1, and in special this of wrath. So there is somewhat proportionable in God if understood suitably to his glorious being, namely, wrath perfectly clean from all dregs of one folly. The fool never more peeps out than in passion. He that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Proverbs 14.29 That is, sets it aloft, that everybody may discern and take notice of it. But the Lord is a God of knowledge, by whom actions are weighed, 1 Samuel 2, 3. 2. Injustice. God's wrath is a clear fire without any smoke of unrighteousness. Is God unrighteous? That inferreth wrath? Romans 3, 5. He cannot be. We plough with an ox and an ass. Deuteronomy 22, 10. Mingle dross with our zeal, etc. Perturbation. The wrath of men is the rage of men, who disjoint and discompose themselves as well as others. Proverbs 11:17. But the Lord acts and suffers not in His wrath. He strikes, wounds, destroys from the infinite holiness and justice of His nature, declaring itself against all sin with the exactest serenity and oneness of mind and frame within himself from everlasting to everlasting. This is the root of all wars with sinful men. Moses saw the plague growing up out of this root. Wrath is gone out from the Lord, and the plague is begun. Numbers 16.46 He distributeth sorrows in his anger. Job 21.17 2. Consider what this wrath implies. Two things. One, that the Lord is highly displeased with men and women in their natural estate. Though never so goodly a varnish of religion be above, yet if nothing but nature be underneath, a hypocritical nation are the people of the Lord's wrath. Isaiah 10, 6. No created understanding can conceive exactly what this displeasure is. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Psalm 90.11 Take some short ladders that our thoughts may a little climb up by, 
and consider seriously and deeply, one, what a king's wrath is. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion, whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. Proverbs 22. That is, acteth as an enemy to his own life. And the wrath of a king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it, as that which he cannot resist. Proverbs 16, 14. Where, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, What doest thou? Ecclesiastes 8, 4. That is, where not only the name, but the reality of the king is, he sustained the person of the commonwealth, and hath the strength and power of all put into his hand, and hath power to execute his wrath, and will not be controlled, but ex- nor expostulated with. What can a branch do against the whole tree? The king is wrath, and Haman's face is covered. Esther 7, 8. A stone is heavy, and the sand weighty, but a fool's wrath, that is, that hath power, is heavier than them both, to crush a weak person that standeth in his way. Proverbs 27, 3. All these are but toys in the power and weight of God's wrath. 2. What an incense brother's wrath is, that hath a little more power. Rebecca, understanding Esau's wrath against Jacob, packs him away till that wrath be over. Genesis 27, 43, 44. If a mother dare not venture a child into an angry son's presence, nor a brother himself into an angry brother's presence, how insufferable will the angry presence of the Lord be? 2. What God's fatherly refining wrath is against the dross that mingleth itself with his worship and ordinances, and what dreadful furnaces he hath put the vessels of mercy into to take away their tin from them. Who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire. Malachi 3.2 If man cannot bear Christ's coming with a refining fire to purge out dross, much less not his coming with flaming fire, to consume and burn up persons and dross together, 2 Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 8. We have need of grace to serve him acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. For our God, that is related to us in Christ, is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 28, 29. 4. What afflictions are, how very bitter yet separated from wrath, they are born with comfort. The mingling of fire with the hail in Egypt made it so very dreadful. Exodus 9, 24, The fire of the Lord's wrath, mingled with storms, renders them so grievous to be stood under. Hell itself would not be so dreadful did not the breath of the Lord, that is the wrath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindle it. Isaiah 30, 33. The prophet submits to any strokes, only deprecates wrath as worse than any strokes, and more deadly than death itself. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment. Not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Jeremiah 10, 24. Apprehensions of wrath were the dregs in Job and Job's cup. O oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldst keep me in secret until thy wrath be passed over. Job 14, 13. He cannot stand in the face of God's wrath, though he knew it was passing and not abiding wrath, and therefore begs a hiding anywhere and in the very grave till that wrath be over. Who then shall dwell with abiding wrath? John 3, 36. With everlasting burnings. Isaiah 33, 14, with fire and brimstone and tempest that hath hatred in it. Psalm 11, 5 and 6. 5. What the Lord's glory is, when it is proclaimed and passes forth in a way of grace, 
only in a little more luster and brightness. Moses needs putting in a cliff of the rock and to be covered with the Lord's hand while the Lord's glory passed by. Exodus 33, 22. Peter is swallowed up at a glimpse of the power of Christ. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Luke 5, 8. What then when he speaketh in his wrath and vexeth in his sore displeasure? Psalm 2, 5. 6. What the Lord's wrath is passing upon others. All the children in the house tremble when the rod is taken down, though not with respect to themselves, but their fellows only. Take a man whose heart is touched with a sense of the Lord's greatness, and that will be his temper. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Isaiah 2.19 7. What the Lord's wrath is, only hanging in the threatening. He rebuked, his rebukes made both the ears of Eli to tingle. 1 Samuel 3.11 2 Kings 21.12 There is a terror when a prince convenes and rates his rebels for their conspiracies and insurrections against him though not yet brought to the bar or block. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself. Habakkuk 3.16 Josiah's heart was tender when he heard what the Lord spoke against Jerusalem and against the inhabitants thereof. 2 Kings 22.19 8. What Christ himself did, under the sense of this wrath to be poured forth, though supported with all the fullness of a Godhead dwelling bodily in him, and saw the glory beyond, and the certainty of his resurrection, and the fruits of the travails of his soul that should be. Colossians 2.9, Hebrews 12.2, Isaiah 53.11 Yet sweats and that clots of blood to the very ground. Luke 22.44 Praise and that with strong cries and tears that if possible this cup might pass. Hebrews 5.7 and Matthew 26.39 Though other considerations made him drink it cheerfully. Luke 12.50 Yet nature droops and cannot bear up under this burden. Those pills are very bitter, that very health itself does hardly sweeten. You that are yet in the mire of mere nature, steep your thoughts in these things, that ye may have a little taste what an evil and bitter thing it is, that God's wrath and displeasure is out against you. But this is not all. God may be displeased, and very highly, with his own people. I was wroth with my people, and polluted mine inheritance. Isaiah 47, 6. Namely, dealt with it as if I polluted an unclean thing. 2. God reckons and will deal with men and women found in their natural estate as his enemies. God's tender-hearted servants have not been able to bear the apprehension of this. He hath also kindled his wrath against me, and he counteth me to him as his enemies. Job 19.11 The plural number increases the sense as his deadly enemy. He that takes the Bible and carefully turns it over and considers the contents thereof and what he has said of those whom he reckons his enemies, will have a further glimpse of the dreadfulness of this condition. He reserveth wrath for his enemies, Nahum 1-2, that is, he hath built and made wide the storehouses of hell, that there might be wrath enough in due season to be drawn forth for them. Those mine enemies, enemies that would not that I should reign over them, bring hither, 
and slay them before me. Luke 19.27 Ah, I will ease me of my adversaries and avenge me of my enemies. Isaiah 1.24 Judgment and fiery indignation shall devour the adversaries. Hebrews 10.27 And this must be applied to both sorts of enemies. One, close. That go closely on in ways of sin, secretly correspond with the devil and his temptations and their darling lusts, and will not lay the bucklers down, though they smile in the Lord's face and seek him daily, and delight to know his ways, as a nation that doeth righteousness and forsaketh not the ordinances of their God. Isaiah 58, 2. Flatter him with their lips, and lie to him with their tongues. Psalm 78, 36. 2. Open enemies that proclaim and declare war against heaven, that do and will do what they please. Let the Lord say and do what he will to the contrary. As Pharaoh, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Exodus 5, 2. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Psalm 7, uh, 12, verse 4. His citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. Luke 19, 14. And understand, when the Lord so deals with this sort of sinners, he takes a kind of comfort in it. Thus shall my anger be accomplished, and I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be comforted. Ezekiel 5.13 To others, the Lord distributes sorrows with sorrows, and speaks of himself as grieved when he puts them to grief. Judges 10.16 and Lamentations 3.33 Isaiah 63.9 But here he is comforted in making them the resting place of his fury. Proverbs 1.26 the heat and height of his fury poured forth upon incurable sinners is comfortable and pleasing to him. In every place where the grounded staff shall pass, which the Lord shall cause to rest upon him, it shall be with tabrets and harps. Isaiah 30, 32. Vengeance on such is music and delight to the Lord and to his people. Revelation 18.20 This is the first and not the meanest part of the misery of fallen man that he is under the Lord's wrath that is such as God is displeased with and will reckon and deal with as his enemies. 2. Every natural man and woman is exposed to and under the curse of the law. Is this nothing to have the word against thee and to have the Lord write bitterly against thee in that very book which is the storehouse of comforts and supports to others. Job thirteen twenty six. Dreadful is that language of Ahab concerning Micaiah. There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. 1 Kings twenty two eight. So that language of a natural man's heart. God's mind is in that book, but I cannot abide to read therein, or to hear it opened and applied to a lively, rousing preacher. For it only raises storms and tumults in my conscience, and speaks not a word of comfort to me. The word, one, rings many a sad peal in the ears of conscience, and which he cannot abide to hear or think of in that it doth declare one, his sin. The word faithfully discovers God's straightness and man's crookedness and swervings from that platform and rule to which he should be conformed as a counterpart to the original. This charges omissions, commissions and bunglings in the good which he does do and sets all in order before his eyes, Psalm 50:21 if possible, to make him ashamed and confounded in himself. 
to the due and desert of sin. Every breaker of the law, the law pronounces and dooms to be cursed. There is that necessary connection that it is impossible to be chargeable with sin against the law and not liable to the curse of the law. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in everything that is written in the book of the law to do it. Galatians 3.10 Justification itself takes not away the desert of sin. Pardoned sins are not as well sins or as such sins as they were. Pardon makes not the malefactor known, makes not that the fact was not committed or not faulty or that it deserved not death. For then he should have been legally acquitted, not graciously pardoned. Those will never take heaven of grace that take not hell as their proper desert. The Lord will have his own wearless rope about their necks, the desert of hell in their hearts to the very grave. Assurance, and in the very highest degree, takes not away the sense of the deserts of sin, yet amplifies and enlarges them. The deserts of sin shall be perfectly acknowledged in the state of glory, and the ransomer adored and admired upon this score. Nothing so heightens grace as this, that persons deserving to suffer are yet freed in Christ from suffering, eternal wrath, as if they had not deserved it. This desert was no, no doubtful and dark point in the consciences of the heathens themselves. They know not the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Romans 1.32 But the word more distinctly lays this home to the heart. The expectation of the wicked is wrath. Proverbs 11.23 There is nothing else that he can justly and suddenly expect in that estate, and expecting otherwise, he does that cozen himself. 3. The sinner's exclusion, while in that estate, for many part in the great and precious promises of the gospel. The word opens the promises, but knocks his fingers off from touching and eating of this tree of life. This is none of the meanest hard-cutting terrors to natural man to see. Many come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven and themselves cast out. Matthew 8, 11, 12 Incorporated with the patriarchs into fellowship of the same grace and title to the same glory and themselves depart from both to view the unsearchable riches of Christ displayed, and themselves jostled off from any intermeddling as to present application or grounds of application of them as their own. I met lately with a godly woman who heard a sermon full of choice, comforting and supporting promises to weary and heavy laden sinners which warmed her heart. But in the closure, was stricken through with the first fierce arrows of God, discerning herself excluded in her present estate, for many part in them. This makes the gospel, a fiery serpent to sting them, which is a pole holding up the brazen serpent for healing to others. 2. The word attaches and binds him over. He shall answer this at the day of Christ, and hangs writ upon his door, as the man that is in God's debt, and is to look for an arrest, and be dragged into prison till the utmost farthing be paid, unless a speedy, timely peace be made, and enforces this, partly from the will and justice of God, that hath made indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, the portion of every soul that goes on to do evil. Romans 2, 8, 9. And partly from the nature and circumstances of sin itself, debts may be so great, so long owing, so growing, and the negligence and boldness of the debt is such that makes it necessary, in point of wisdom, 
not to keep the writ longer off from his back. Three, the word excites terrors. A man bound in a very great sum, in which the forfeiture will be his undoing, the very obligation troubles. There are no debts but, where an ingenuity is, induce answerable cares. And the Lord, knowing the frame, and tendering the peace of his people, advises therefore against all debts, especially sticking under them, and not coming timely and carefully off. O oh, no man anything, Romans 13, 8, much more, to be overhead and ears in God's debt, and no care to agree with him, is a very dreadful condition. Matthew 5, 25. If these terrors actually are not, yet they are very subject every moment to be excited. The sea may be very calm, but the least storm makes it nothing but commotions. Conscience, though now quiet, has a very wide and clamorous mouth when the Lord commissions and commands it to rebuke for sin. These terrors hold the sinner in bondage, or all his lifetime subject under bondage. Hebrews 2.15 this is the second branch of the misery of a natural state. To be in all these respects under the curse of the law, and have the Lord fight against him with the sword of his mouth. Revelation 2.16 Here is patience, that the Lord will fight with this sword first, that he may reclaim and lead to repentance, rather than destroy him. And if this prevail, then is the curse turned into a blessing, and the bondage ends in liberty indeed, and if this do not prevail, then there remains nothing else, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment, and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Hebrews 10, 27. 3. Every natural man and woman is obnoxious to all the effects of the wrath of God, and of the curses denounced in his word. 1. There are manifold effects of God's wrath that are upon him, or are apt every moment to be rushing in upon him in, his, in this life. 1. Upon the body. Look upon all the breaches, flaws, defects, monstrosities in the body, and set them upon the score of sin. Every man else had been like Absalom, and much more, from the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no there was no blemish in him. 2 Samuel 14.25 These argue not special sin, John 9.2, yet had never been without sin. Look upon all diseases, natural or adventitious. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. John 5.14 There had never been a stone in the reins or in the bladder, if not first in the heart. These crumblings by degrees into the dust flow in by sin. We pity the ruins which war hath made in goodly places, but those are nothing to the havoc which sin hath made in the more noble fabrics of our own bodies. Look upon the difficulties, cares, turmoils, for provisions of us and, our, us and ours. Genesis 2.17 Labour is with toil, Weariness, vexation, disappointment. We plough and sow, and reap not. Earn, and put it in a bag with holes. Haggai 1.6 Look upon shameful nakedness. We have lost our robes of glory, and need now the spoils of beasts to cover our shame with. Genesis 3.21 How many trades are there, and what toil in them? Merely for this end, that the dishonour of the body may be hidden. Look upon the sorrows of the female sex, verse 16, which though mitigated and mingled with promises, yet still are arrows which sin has shot into their sides, and grace does not quite pluck them forth. 1 Timothy 2.15 Look upon the assaults made, even to our ruin, by those things that are otherwise were under our feet. Psalm 8 6. But now withdraw from the yoke, serve with groans, remissness, and much unserviceableness, 
and often lift up their heel and turn and tear us. These are a very small part, and only bear hints of those confusions and effects of the Lord's wrath, which sin hath let into the body, which else hath been invulnerable in the very heel. 2. Upon the soul, consider 1. The mind Oh, what blindness, ignorance, thick darkness in the apprehensions of God, his very being, most self-evidencing attributes in the very mysteries of the first magnitude which are the rules of our duty and grounds of our hope incapableness, dullness, slowness to believe loathness to inquire or receive the light which shineth forth from heaven, doubts, distrust, mistakes, wanderings after that which is not light, and to ways that seem right, but the ends of them are the ways of death. Proverbs 14.12 The heresies of the whole earth are seminally in the blindness of the mind, and would grow up from thence, though they were none of our many sowers to scatter them, nothing being nothing else but corrupt imaginations formed into a system, and profitableness in the knowledge of truth which we must most clearly and distinctly conceive, and steadiness that we cannot fix and close upon holy thoughts till the impressions thence be powerful and work a real change. There is no spaniel more wild and running after every lark and butterfly that rises in his way than our thoughts are gathering after everything that comes in our way. Yea, our mind gathers vanity to itself, when the eyes are shut, and no objects to divert and inveigle us with. These are sins, and yet are rushing in further, as the recompenses of further sins which are meet. Romans 1, 27. 2. The memory. Things stick there that a man would gladly learn and count it a singular mercy to attain the art of forgetfulness of, and others leak and slip away, though taught often plainly, repeated, mused upon, and we felt the power of them in a degree upon our hearts. What indisposition, what indispos, indispositions to the use of means in order to a cure? What proneness to cumber ourselves with by matters to lay talk with us sleeping? and crowd in and suck away Lord's days themselves, and leave nothing but straps of prayer and preaching to us. Sin first brought in these plagues, and wrath binds them on, and leaves traditionally the reins loose to them. 3. Conscience The directing part is out of tune, and either gives no directions, as a master that is nobody in his family, or gives wrong directions as false lights on the shore leads the ships upon the rocks and quicksands, forbids where the Lord commands, and urges to that which he forbids. John 16.2, Titus 1.15, or gives right directions, and hath no authority. And the judgment part of conscience is out of tune, and gives no judgment of what is done, like a bell whose clapper is out, or a dumb dog that cannot bark, or gives perverse judgment, and excuses where it should accuse, makes sin no sin, or very little, and stays the heart with empty comforts, or accuses for having done that which is, he is bound to do, and disquiets with undue fears, or accuses rightly for the matter, yet with excess, and so sinks the soul under despair, so that there is an there is as much need for conscience to be overseen as to oversee, to be guided as to guide. These hours abide in, and the venom of them invades more and more, and that is very dreadful effect of the wrath of God. 4. The will. There are sad strokes there. A perseness, an impotence, unto that which is spiritually good, Philippians 3.13, Psalm 10.4. Inclinations and biases to drink in the very first and the very worst notions and suggestions unto sin. Lustings after evil things, Job 15.16, and against the spirit, Galatians.
Galatians 5.17, stubbornness, Romans 8.3, contempt of the office of reconciliation, John 5.40, Ezekiel 33.11, in compliance with the counsels of the Holy Ghost, Acts 7.51, these are cords of man's twisting, and the Lord in dreadful wrath says, be it so, and pinions him with them, to the last judgment. 5. The affections fly upon, uh, upon unmeet objects, headingly inclining to them, and clasp and cleave there, and cannot be gotten off, recoil from what, from that which is good, are stirred in respect of evil to embrace it, and in respect of good to askew and be weary of it. Ahab imprisons the true prophets and sets the false at his own table and gives them his ear and heart, are full of disorders, more offended with our injuries than God's Mary and the Holy Ghost call, call it madness. Ecclesiastes 2.2 2, Mourn and swallowed up. 2 Corinthians 2.7 Can it be raised to things above? and settled on them. We complain, and justly of servants that are nimble and expert in any piece of knavery, and lozels, loiterers at their work. This is the very temper of our hearts, nimble and wise to do evil, but in the, way, the way, things and ways of God, and which are of greatest necessity and advantage, we have no knowledge, and a sharper wrath is not than the law to leave us to ourselves. Psalm 78, 30, and 81, 12. These are hints, no more, of the Lord's wrath upon the soul. 3. Upon the estate. Look upon the general estate of the whole creation, impaired, groaning, and subject unto vanity, into the public state, confusion, stumbling blocks, underminings of civil and spiritual liberties, etc., into the particular estates of men, snarls, damages, wrongs, polings, plunderings, men taken and carried whither they would, build and dwell not therein, gather and it melts as butter against the sun, etc. 4. Upon relations, unequal marriages, yoke fellows disloyal, wasteful, idle, withholding more than is meat, troubling their own flesh, dampers in the ways of God, suddenly stricken, and the greatest comforts leave the smartest wounds after them, etc. Unfaithful servants, looking only to the pastor's eye, invading that which is not theirs, embezzling or suffering to go to wreck, that which by care they might and ought to preserve. Children, sickly, and natural, taken to no callings, or not diligent and faithful in them, dispose themselves without consent, run themselves into briars, and see their error when too late to retreat. This is wrath in domestic relations, and wrath is terribly mixed in public relations. Ministers preach not, oversee not, are not examples to the flock, have not experience, nor ability, nor care, rightly to divide the word of truth, and muzzle the gainsayer, are misled themselves, and mislead others, etc. Magistrates mind not the things of Christ, are tight and vigilant, of the good indulgent to the evil, bear the sword in vain, etc. Such bios there is much, wrath poured through. 5. Upon the holy things of God, and of his people. Ours come not with acceptance to God. The Lord, not with savour, closeness, authority, etc. to us. The very book of the covenant needs sprinkling. Hebrews 9, 19. The law, which is pure and clean, Psalm 19, 8 and 9, is made a killing letter, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. The gospel, which is the grace of God bringing salvation, Titus 2.11, 
He's made a savour of death unto death. 2 Corinthians 2.16 The Lord's Supper, an eating and, dri- uh, an eating and drinking judgment to ourselves. 1 Corinthians 11.29 And Christ himself is made the falling. Luke 2.34 And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offence. 1 Peter 2.8 Without Christ's blood, taking away sin, the very book of grace had never been opened. Revelation 5, 4. And though the choicest in itself, being opened, would never have been useful unto us, and sore a wrath cannot be than to curse our very blessings, Malachi 2, 2, and the very means of grace, that they shall be useless, and for judgment. 6. Upon the whole man, the person is under the effects of wrath. One, enslaved to the devil. This is plain. One, from the scriptures. Else converting grace could not deliver from the power of darkness. Galatians, Galatians 1, 3, 13. Nor man be said, when God gives repentance, to cover themselves out of the snare of the devil, that they were taken captive by him at his will. 2 Corinthians 2, 25-26 2. From the likeness of man's work with Satan's men of a trade are ordinarily of a company together but here the rule fails not he that committeth sin is of the devil 1 John 3.8 that is by doing the same work discovers himself of communion with and enthralled them to him the first binders of a craft our fathers, Genesis 4, 20, 21, and successors and imitators in the craft are called children. We naturally and freely do the devil's work. The lust of the lusts of your father ye will do, John, John 8, 44, and have no mind to the Lord's work, nor can brook the same to be done circumspectly and exactly by others. No child of the devil no enemy of all righteousness. Acts 13.10 3. From the community of principles, the very mind and will of Satan is engraven upon our spirits and express themselves in efficacy and obstinacy of sinning. These principles are Satan's image instead of God's. 4. From the natural man's subjection to the guidance of Satan, regenerate persons are led by the Spirit, but Satan filleth the hearts of natural men. He hath possession of Judah's heart, and, and by a piece of money rides deeper into him, and prevails to engage him to betray Christ. This is a lamentable branch of the natural man's misery. 2. He is banished and separated from God, both from conformity to and communion with him, and doth electively banish and cast himself forth of the Lord's presence. This appears, one, from the former point, namely man's fellowship with Satan. There cannot be fellowship with God and with Satan together. These communions are inconsistent in the same spirit at the same time, in a reigning intense degree. 2. From God's end and his apostles and ministers in the writing, explanation and application of the scripture. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. 1 John 1 3 were this fellowship already in the state of nature, there needed not this means of rebringing into the fellowship with God. Defiers of the evil one with their mouths are not the less in league with him in their hearts. 3. From the language of the tongue heart, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Job 21.14 This they speak internally, and the desire of their souls is to be rid of God. Notions of God are a sapless and burdensome piece of knowledge. 
They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Romans 1.28 To banish ourselves is the height of man's sin and folly, and to be banished the height of the Lord's wrath and of man's misery. Now do we know what a man loses in the loss of God? That is impossible for any created understanding to conceive. The world is a dungeon without the sun, the body a carrion without the soul, but neither so necessary as God is to the soul. A taste of the goodness of God made the world and the lives of the martyrs nothing to them. In thy favour is life, Psalm 30 verse 5. And thy loving kindness is better than life, Psalm 63, 3. The very heaven of heavens lies in the enjoyment of God, and the hell of hell in the loss of him. The loss of him is the loss of the fountain, from which all kind of good doth or can come. The loss of the cause is the loss of all the effects, of all the blessed affections, influences, and promises of God. The loss of all those blessed hopes that fill the soul with joy unspeakable and full of glory. No prayer, praises, faith, love, fear, or any spark of other grace are to be found in truth upon the heart, the half of that heart. Now the person in league with the devil and banished from and without God in the world must needs be miserable and accursed. 3. He is discontented and unprofitable in every condition. They are altogether become unprofitable. Romans 3.12 The Holy Ghost makes a natural man of no more use than rotten things which we cast forth to the dunghill for their unprofitableness. This is a dreadful ruin that a creature so excellent should become unprofitable to others and very far from comfort to himself in any condition. The wife, having all for use, and the husband's heart, have nothing, because not the authority, dominion, and disposition which is proper to the husband. Israel have bread and quails from heaven, and water from the rock that followed them, a table every wise furnished for need and for delight, and yet grumble because not meet for their lusts. Many have all things very good, and the wisdom of heaven could not carve better and better things, and it all not good enough. Let sin creep in, and Adam will not be content in paradise, or the apostate angels in heaven, but leave their own habitation. Go from God, and take thy leave and farewell of contentment and satisfaction. 4. He has grown a wolf and devil to his brethren, biting and devouring, Galatians 5.15, tearing, pulling, catching at advantage, flying upon the necks of the weaker. Men execute much of the wrath of God in these feuds among themselves, so that the caution is very necessary. Beware of men, Matthew 10.17, in a sort, as of any wild beast, or the very devils themselves. This is a glimpse of that wrath which the Lord draweth forth against natural men in this life before the sons of men. 2. There are further degrees of this wrath that rush in at the end of this life. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. The bodies are the very heirs of glory, and which are temples of the Holy Ghost, lie trampled upon under rottenness, and suffer loss of their appointed glory till the last day. The Lord batters them, till the house tumbles about their ears. He lays on load till the heartstrings crack. And to whom hell is remitted, death is not remitted. Those must die that shall not be damned for their sins, and death shall have dominion over them till the morning of the resurrection. There is a progress in God's wrath, which will not stop in the midway, but goes on till it shall be accomplished. Ezekiel 5.13 5.13 3. 
The full vials and very dregs of this wrath shall be poured out in the world to come, which now God reigns in. And let's not get loose and break over the banks, or if it do, call it back and turn it the way. But then, all his wrath shall be stirred up and let forth to the full, Psalm 78, 38. 1. There shall be the general judgment of the great day, in which the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, and shall be revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire, terribly to execute the curses of that law which was so terrible in the promulgation. 2 Timothy, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. Then shall the sinner be forced from his grave, dragged to the bar, arraigned, the books opened, all the secrets of darkness and of the heart made manifest, and the goats put on the left hand, and have that dismal sentence, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25:41. Two, there shall be dreadful and final, final execution. And this stands in two things. One, in loss. Expulsion from the Lord's face and presence and glory. As incurable lepers from the camp and fellowship of the saints. From the good things which they never cared for and from the good things of the world which they grasped and were their portion from all hopes of grace, all preachings of peace, all strivings of the Spirit, never a friend to comfort, a sun to shine, or a drop of water to cool the tongue, or any blessings to come near them any more forever. Two, in sense, what is sometimes termed suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, Jude 7, wrath to come, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 Where there shall be, with the damned angels, subjection to the eternal wrath of God, the worm of a guilty conscience that never dies, where the Lord will bear up the creature with one hand, that it continue in being, and beat it with the other, that it shall be ever dying, in death always, and never dead. Uses Use 1 Information we may clearly gather divers corollaries hence. 1. This may inform us of the vast and woeful change that sin hath made. Men could not come, possibly, such out of the hands of God. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and therefore blessed. Genesis 1.31 The sin hath taken him from Mount Gerizim, and set him upon evil. Deuteronomy 27, 12, 13. And the misery now is such that if the Lord should open the same to the conscience fully, the very view would drive men out of their wits, and men would not carry in their beds or relish a morsel of bread till delivered, and blessed with some evidence of deliverance out of that condition. 2. This may inform us of the causelessness of the offence taken at ministers for preaching this point. Now consider seriously, one, is there a parallel to the offence taken here in other, any other case in the whole earth? Who is angry with a watchman for giving notice of the, that the house is beset and ready to be broken up or on fire? They will all be disturbed, some half frighted out of their wits or wholly with the tidings, and very great pudder Pother follows till the house be secured and the fire quenched. Men might otherwise have been undone and destroyed in their beds. Who flies out against a sentinel that gives a true alarm and rouses the soldiers at the deadest time of the night? He prevents their surprisal or throats being cut in their beds and the town from being sacked. Who storms at a passenger that sticks up a bow in a quagmire the other travellers, going securely on, may not be laid fast ere they think of any danger. 
Who takes it ill of a friend that seeing a bearded arrow coming that should strike the stander next him mortally, pulls him aside with that force possibly as to draw his arm out of joint, and the arrow goes not through his heart? Who thinks amiss of a lawyer that opens the badness of his client's cause to him, that he may not insist on the wrong point, in which necessarily he must be cast? Two. Should we, to avoid your displeasure, not give you warning, and so draw God's displeasure, and the blood of you perishing upon our heads? Ezekiel 3, 18, 19. Is, good, is this good for you or us? 3. Do you well to provoke poor ministers to bolt that part of their office, which flesh and blood makes us too willing to have our heads taken off in? Desire we to be messengers of sad tidings, or rather to come in the abundance of the comforts of the gospel? A pettish patient makes a surgeon search the wound less than is necessary to a thorough care. You tempt us to stop from speaking needfully of your danger by your loathness to hear on that ear, and by your rage and regret against the teller. Those who have most need of faithful intelligence of the Lord's wrath, have least upon this very score. Who shall declare his way to his face, namely that is respited and prospers, and tramples the doctrine underfoot, and turns again and tears the preacher? Job 21, 31. 4. This is no other than what the scripture speaks, and conscience upon retirements will speak, and Satan will lay in your dish, and the Lord will pay into your bosom. Will those fly in the Lord's face and of conscience, telling the story to them, and pronouncing a sentence against them? O oh, profane partial spirits, they cannot endure such preachers as themselves shall be unto themselves. They cannot bear the hearing of those terrors that themselves shall be relators and inflictors of upon themselves. You had better have the commodity at the first hand. Conscience will preach in another note and loudness than we do, and the more because your ears have been stopped against our words. 5. There cannot be a greater madness than not to be able to live under the noise and news of this wrath, and yet stick under the wrath itself. The hearing makes the ears tingle, but the wrath does not make the heart quake. Ye had better hear the heralds in the prince's name denouncing the war and send out the peace than have the prince himself come with fire and sword into your bowels upon the contempt. 3. This may inform us of the righteousness and wisdom of the Lord in this wrath annexed and declared against sin. 1. Consider the high rewards the Lord hath propounded. The law is not so fiery in commiserations against sin, but the gospel is as full of grace and promises to the ways of duty. 1 Corinthians 2.9 and 2 Corinthians 12.4 Now bring things to bar of reason itself, and may not the Lord annex this dreadful wrath to sin, that doth annex such glorious, incomprehensible promises to the duties and weak services of his people? Sin strictly deserves these not. May not he punish severely that rewards eminently? How just is it that persons invited to the supper and making excuses should not taste thereof? Luke 14.24 That despisers of the recompenses of God should suffer eternal loss of them and be scourged with the contrary to them. 2. Consider the ends the Lord hath designed to reach. 1. In the elect. 1. To startle. I will for your new whom ye shall fear. Fear him which hath, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Luke 12, 5. Faith in the threatening engenders fear as faith in the promise genders hope. Faith 
and fear were conjoined in Noah and wrought together in his obedience and preservation. Hebrews 11, 7. 2. To make all things else little that meet them in the world, to shoulder them off from the truth and homage of Christ. A merchant in a storm throws his goods overboard. The wrath of God makes a startled sinner part with anything and concur in anything rather than incur that. Moses had rather incur the wrath of a thousand pharaohs than the wrath of God because he knew the power of his wrath. As God's people have rewards promised that outweigh all that were, that outweigh all that are called to part with, so terrors propounded that all other terrors may be overlooked and incurred rather than these. Three, to worm out the esteems of the world and the sensual pleasures, honours and profits thereof, the fuel of lust. There is need of violence to pull out of this fire. Now he that propounds an end pitches upon means fitted to compass that end. A cleaver of knotty timber must have a wedge that will go through. The mother that will wean the child must lay such bitter things on the breast as will make the child loathe the milk. So the Lord hath declared those wages to sin that shall turn the edge of love and liking to sin. That had needs be very bitter that shall make these very sweets bitter to us. No lesser evils would work the sense of that evil of sin into the conscience. And those secretly grudge and complain of the pains as too great, to whom they are too little to awaken and lead them to repentance. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle is adopted by the papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important. When he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.